Hi, I'm Dan Ashley, the evening news anchor for ABC 7 News in San Francisco, and I hope you and your loved ones are staying safe, healthy, and comfortable during these very challenging times. I am also a proud board member of the Commonwealth Club, one of our most important Bay Area institutions. The club has been hosting wonderful events with exciting speakers and topics in the Bay Area for over a century. In times of crisis, good information and strong connections in our community are especially important. And during the current COVID-19 crisis, the club has really stepped up. Since March 6th, the club has brought you over 100 live streamed events with speakers and panelists, including past governors, secretaries of state, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, mayors, county supervisors, respected medical experts, the president of the University of California, experts on anxiety and happiness in times of stress, and many, many more. Every program includes a live chat, so you and viewers all over the Bay Area and beyond have been able to ask these experts the questions that are on your minds. Every program has been neutral and unbiased in true Commonwealth Club style to get to the bottom of the issues that are so drastically affecting our lives. The club has done all this public service despite being profoundly affected by the crisis. The inability to hold events for the past two months has forced the club to cut its budget and staffing by 50 percent. The remaining staff are working from home to bring the community these valuable and informative live streamed programs. The club needs your support to continue its shelter at home programming. Please make a tax deductible donation to the club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the Commonwealth Club website, commonwealthclub.org. We need the club to be here in the months and years ahead to help inform and educate as we figure out how to get our society and our economy safely moving again. Consider changes to the way we live and work as a result of this crisis and take steps to prevent a future pandemic. Once again, please support the Commonwealth Club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the website commonwealthclub.org. I want to personally thank you for supporting one of our community's truly great organizations. I'll see you on ABC 7 News and at the Commonwealth Club. Stay safe. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club and our uh, virtual program today. My name is E.J. Dion. I'm a columnist for The Washington Post, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. I teach at Georgetown and Harvard, and I am honored to be your moderator today. I was deeply grateful that I had a chance to be at the Commonwealth Club in person for my book, Code Red, and I think every book writer in America is deeply grateful for the conversations that the Commonwealth Club uh, permits. Um, I wish we could all be together uh, today uh, in the same place. I wish I could be back in San Francisco with Jacob and Paul, but the club has wisely uh, suspended its in-person programming, but it's been hosting a series, as you just heard, of awesome uh, video events. Uh, you can learn of uh, upcoming events uh, or becoming a member of the club by visiting www.commonwealthclub, all one word, uh, dot or. Um, and just to reiterate what you heard, the club is grateful for your generous support uh, and uh, hopes you'll consider making a donation by clicking, uh, making a donation online or texting donate uh, to 415 uh, 329 uh, 4231. Uh, 415 329 4231. Uh, the club also encourages you to subscribe and share videos like this one with your friends and family. Um, we're going to take your questions during this call. Again, I wish you were there in person so we could see you and hear you out, but we will hear you out uh, if you submit uh, your questions. Uh, in the chat box, I'm going to have them here, and I'm going to uh, lean very hard on your questions uh, because I know that uh, both Jacob and Paul are going to want to hear what's on your mind. 
Um, it's a real pleasure to introduce two people I really admire, Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson. Their new book has a wonderful title, and it's a wonderful book. It's called Let Them Eat Tweets, How the Right Rules in an Age of Extreme Inequality. Uh, Jacob is a professor of political science uh, and uh, at Yale uh, University, uh, and he is a director of the Institutions for Social and Policy Studies at Yale. Um, he's a regular uh, media contributor and policy advisor and has written extensively about American politics uh, and public policy. Uh, Paul is a professor right near where many of you are. He's a professor of political science uh, at UC Berkeley. Uh, he, too, is a frequent commentator uh, on uh, politics and public affairs. His teaching and research covers American politics and public policy, comparative political economy, uh, and uh, social theory. Um, please join me in virtually welcoming um, Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson. And I can, even here in Bethesda, Maryland, I can hear the applause ringing out all over the country for both of you. Uh, welcome, it's great to see you. Thanks for doing Thank it. Thank you, EJ. Pleasure to be here. Um, let's just take it from the top with the most simple question possible. From each of your points of view, I'd just like you to explain why you came to this book. I wouldn't mind hearing about how you came up with the brilliant title. Um, and how this fits into a series of books you have written over time. And it, to me, and I'm not alone in this, the New York Times review suggested this as well, a very good review in the Times, you all should know, um, that this is a culmination of a lot of work as well as a fresh look uh, at where we are. Um, why don't I start with Jacob and then Paul to sort of situate this book both in your own work uh, and in the argument we are having right now uh, in the presidential campaign. Uh, thanks so much, EJ. Um, it's really an honor to have you be moderating this event. Um, your work has had a big influence on me, and, and uh, I've also really learned a lot uh, from Code Red, your recent book. God so, bless you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this book really is an outgrowth of a long term project that Paul and I have been doing that goes back to the mid 2000s. And we became very concerned with the way the Republican Party and rising inequality were going together in the United States. And our basic argument was that as inequality was rising, those at the top of the economic ladder were increasingly allied with the Republican Party. And, uh, and the kinds of policies that resulted, the big tax cuts, the deregulation of finance, um, and uh, and others, those policies uh, further in increase the resources and power of those at the top. So while it isn't just the Republican Party, it's mostly a story about the radicalization of the Republican Party. But, but as Paul, I think, can elaborate, as we started to cope with the unexpected rise of Donald Trump, we realized that we'd really missed a fundamental aspect of this story, which is the way in which as the party became closer and closer to those at the very top, it had to develop a set of, of strategies for keeping voters who aren't at the very top, indeed, who are losing out because of rising inequality, uh, in, uh, to vote, voting for that party, voting for them. And so as the review in the, in the Times said, we, we kind of revisit that old question from Thomas Frank, you know, what's the matter with Kansas? Uh, but our answer is, is somewhat different. We really think this is a story about how elites uh, at the top, uh, began to use really incendiary appeals and work with really extreme groups like the NRA to mobilize voters uh, without giving those voters what they really wanted on economics. And, and in a way, Donald Trump is a sort of culmination of that strategy. He's not, he's, he turned the dial to 11, but he did so on an existing political machine. Paul? So I, I want to join Jacob in, in just uh, indicating my thanks to, to EJ and to the Commonwealth Club for giving us a chance to have have this conversation, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, I, I guess just a, a couple other things that I'd, I'd emphasize right at the start. Um, I, in, in one sense, I do think this book is a culmination of uh, a lot of thinking we've done over, over a period of a couple of decades of, over about the, the growth of extreme inequality in the U.S. And, and the U.S. is actually uh, quite unusual, re really unique among rich democracies 
in the extent to which inequality has grown uh, and uh, both the economic power and the political power of the wealthy and major corporations uh, has grown. Uh, and how that's been connected to the, the rather shocking development, we think, of the Republican Party uh, culminating, as Jacob said, in, in the rise of Donald Trump. Uh, but, but the book represents a, an important departure in a second respect. And I think we, we really begin by acknowledging that we haven't paid enough attention uh, to, uh, to racial divisions within American society and the central role that they play in our politics, which of course is so evident today uh, and was so evident with the rise of Donald Trump. Uh, but, but the case that we make in the book is that actually this rise of economic uh, inequality um, and the growing racial conflict and racial cleavage that is so openly expressed now in our politics on the right, um, these things are actually intimately connected. And so we explore in the book um, there's actually a lot of historical precedent for this, both in the United States and uh, in other countries, that conservative parties operating in a context of extreme inequality find themselves, as they try to, they try to win elections, which requires them to appeal to voters who are not benefiting from this extreme inequality, they find themselves drawn to make these other kinds of appeals to sharpening the divisions along other lines within a society uh, in order to try to win elections. So we really are trying to explore how this, this intimate connection between this kind of, this fierce uh, white ethno-nationalist politics that has emerged in the American right is connected to the rise of, of income inequality and wealth inequality in the US. I'd like to ask you both about, if you will, varieties of conservative behavior. Um, I've been reading um, an old book, not an old book, but a, a book published many years ago, a biography of Harold Macmillan, who was a conservative prime minister in Great Britain. And there was a moment when conservative parties, partly reflecting on the damage of the Great Depression, uh, worry about the spread of communism in Europe, adopted policies that were rather sympathetic to the welfare state and that their way of winning the votes of working class voters was not to adopt a politics of race or division or nationalism, but was to say, essentially, we can deliver benefits to you too. Disraeli did that famously uh, in Britain, but we can be more efficient about it. We're not like those socialists. We can make capitalism work, but we are willing to give you the things you need just like our opponents are. Why, and you could argue Dwight Eisenhower did that to a significant degree. Um, even Richard Nixon uh, did that uh, to a significant degree. What the heck happened to American conservatism that they have given up on that older, more moderate form of conservatism that worked pretty well for conservative parties, not only in the US, but, uh, but around the democratic world? What the heck happened to lead us to this point? Uh, either of you can start. Well, I think that's exactly right, EJ, to, to emphasize that this is not inevitable. Um, and, um, that we, and we explore in the book, we go back to thinking about Disraeli um, and, and drawing a contrast between the way that British conservatives uh, responded to the challenges of competing in a democratic process where you, you had to make uh, appeals and you had to respond to the concerns of ordinary voters. And we contrast that experience with the German experience, which of course turns out in a, a much uglier fashion. But you're right uh, that a conservative party can, and there are lots of historical examples of this, uh, develop in more moderate ways, uh, in ways that, that, that respond to the felt needs of voters, uh, that introduce uh, some other issues in, in politics uh, involving religion or, or, or cultural issues that, that people care about, uh, but do so in a way that doesn't feed into this kind of extremism. The, the, and, and in fact, you could go back to Richard Nixon, who on economic issues uh, was, by current standards, he was well left of center uh, and, and recognized that in order to, to succeed politically, he needed to appeal to the, the uh, needs that people felt on these kinds of economic issues. But Republicans have moved away from that path over the last 40 years and especially over the last 25 years. And uh, part of that is because inequality has become so much worse. 
right? And that, that's increased the power of the 1% uh, in our politics and their influence within the Republican Party. But as we recount in the book, and Jake, you may want to say a little bit more about this, uh, as we recount in the book, there were a number of opportunities where important figures in the conservative party argued for a different kind of path, uh, argued for the kind of path that you've described that Harold McMillan or Benjamin Disraeli outlined. Uh, but those efforts were defeated. Yeah, I mean, you know, like so much else about our toxic politics today, we really look back to the Newt Gingrich period in Congress as a critical turning point because People remember that Gingrich was a bomb thrower. I think what they forget is that he was also a rainmaker. Um, and he really created a powerful political machine within the Republican Party. And it had all of the key figures who became future leaders of the parties had some connection to it, including John Boehner. And they basically let corporations come in and write <laughs> actually write the, the regulations and rules and laws that they were putting in place. And um, and there was a real uh, shift towards a much more hostile view of, of government and a much more kind of divisive politics. And that, that was one turning point. But uh, the one that I think is often forgotten is that John McCain actually kind of set out a different kind of republicanism in the 2000 uh, election when he was running against George W. Bush. And George W. Bush explicitly repudiated his father, said he was going to massively cut taxes, whereas George H.W. Bush had, had violated his no new taxes pledge. And when it looked like McCain, who was supporting a much more moderate economic platform and a much more kind of pro, pro um, uh, political, you know, political reformist pa package, um, when McCain looked like he was a threat, um, it, W. buried him in South Carolina with a racist campaign that, you know, even would have made the, the great, you know, political... Uh, uh, Machiavelli, uh, Lee Atwater, who had passed away in 1991, but who was behind so many of these racially infused themes, um, they would have made him proud, right? This was a really nasty campaign. And of course, we now remember Bush as being kind of an establishment corporate figure. But remember, Bush ended his presidency massively unpopular too. And he did so because of the way in which his, he shifted government away from evidence, away from learning from mistakes and toward the priorities of the super rich. And so this is the process that, that happens. And, and I'll just mention really quickly, EJ, the, the one last moment where this was reckoned with within the party was the 2013 autopsy after Mitt Romney lost. And the Republicans were like, well, we really need to get uh, Hispanics on board. Uh, of course, Donald Trump obliterates that. But I think something that's forgotten is that Bush um, got Hispanics on board, not just because he was pro-immigration, but because a lot of people thought he was more moderate than he actually ended up being. And so too in 2013, right, Republicans said, oh, we're going we're gonna to do immigration reform. But what they didn't say is we're going to not pursue massive tax cuts for the rich, right? And so more and more, they had to lean on these racial and anti-immigrant themes because they weren't willing to moderate uh, with regard to their prior, their economic uh, plutocratic economic priorities. Uh, plutocratic populism, uh, you write about in the book, which you can talk about here. Um, there are a series of um, vicious cycle or chicken and egg issues that you raise in this book and have raised uh, in other books. I, I want to put a couple of them on the table. Um, one is you make note of the fact that in a time of extreme inequality, this sort of ethno-nationalist, at times ex almost explicitly racist politics, becomes a necessity. Yet there were also policies the party pursued all the way back to Reagan that actually fed this inequality. So how do you take that cycle uh, apart? What, were, what caused what? Um, secondly, what you're seeing now in the Republican Party is um, a, the destruction of all elements, both in the electorate and among elected officials, who might have been a moderating force on any of these issues. You know, in two respects, that uh, at election time, either right-wingers have beaten moderates in primaries or 
uh, relatively Democratic Cap D, Democratic electorates that had been comfortable electing moderate or liberal Republicans stopped doing so because they felt doing so was only empowering um, a right wing Republican leadership. The congressional district I sit in was represented by a very liberal Republican called Connie Morella. Everybody loved Connie Morella. They still do. But they eventually voted her out of office. A little bit of redistricting had something to do with it, but it was because they didn't want to support a Gingrich Boehner uh, majority in Congress. Um, and now you have in the electorate itself lots of people who thought of themselves as Republican, uh, partly because of Trump, but starting earlier than that in like the suburbs around Philadelphia just said, we're not Republican anymore. So take those push-pull factors. You were nodding a lot, Paul. I always tell my students it's dangerous to smile in my class because I tend to call on students who smile. So you were smiling, so I'll call on you. I I, I wanna be called on, I'm I'm ready. Um, (laughs) So so the book is actually, I think, full of of these kind of chicken and egg kind of elements. No, that's why I I asked. Many people, Many people who have been observing American politics over the last 30 or 40 years a- ask themselves a- a- about th- these kinds of things, like what's really driving this? Um, and, I- and I think what we're really emphasizing in a lot of ways is that uh, there's a dynamic that sort of reinforces and intensifies these kinds of processes over time. And so, you know, when Jacob is talking about how there are these sort of these exit ramps um, from this um, plutocratic populist path that, that leads to Donald Trump. You know, the, the exit ramps get um, uh, more and more difficult to take as the story goes, goes further along and as this process intensifies. You know, but, it, so, but the distance we traveled from, say, George Herbert Walker Bush uh, in the late 80s and early 90s uh, to where we are now is quite a distance. I mean, the Republican Party was still willing to support increasing uh, taxes on the wealthy and uh, strengthening the Clean Air Act um, as, as late as 1990. Uh, so, so the process has gained momentum over time. And one thing that we think is very important to it, and I think it, it feeds right into uh, your recounting of the, of the congressional district that you're in, is that when the Republican Party starts to recognize that it's got to um, sharpen its cultural appeals uh, in order to uh, bring more downscale voters uh, into its coalition and give them reasons to vote Republican. One of the things that it does is it develops relationships with what we call surrogate groups uh, who are really good at, um, at ginning up the base, right? At what we now think of as the base, uh, who are, are, are good at generating anger, good at generating a, a, a feeling of threat, uh, who are trusted within local communities, uh, and, and these forces become more and more powerful and more closely connected with uh, the Republican Party as this story moves along. Uh, in the book, we talk in particular about uh, what happens to the Christian right, e- the evangelical leaders, uh, the National Rifle Association, and of course, right-wing media, uh, which is an extraordinarily powerful force and is growing, uh, uh, growing in strength over time. Uh, remember back in the early 90s when Newt Gingrich is starting, Fox News doesn't even exist yet, right? It, it's talk radio that is carrying uh, that is carrying um, a lot of the weight there, but it's joined soon um, by Fox and, and, of course, later on joined by, by forces like, like Breitbart, which intensify all this even more. Um, so all of these groups are... Uh, you know, are part of what makes that chicken and egg process become become more and more intense and more and more dangerous over time. And we use the metaphor, we, you know, we refer to this as Pandora's box, um, that Republicans seeking a way to gain support among ordinary citizens rely increasingly on these groups that are great at generating outrage. Um, but they can't control the groups either. And, you know, one of the striking things in the evolution of the Republican Party is the way in which high-flying figures within the party, including ones who were extremely conservative uh, and were seen as conservative uh, and, you know, on the right uh, at the time that they were coming to power, like Eric Cantor uh, or John Boehner or Paul Ryan, finally, uh, how uh, how these prominent leaders end up falling. Um, as Boehner, Boehner's chief of staff put it, we, 
we were eaten by the beast. You know, we fed the beast and, and the beast ate us, uh, is what he says. And that, that's an important part of this dynamic. You know, and just my, one of my favorite John F. Kennedy quotes I always think of in this respect, he who writes to power on the back of the tiger ends up inside. And I think that's what happened to so many of these, these figures. Let me just uh, sharpen Paul's point to you, uh, Jacob. Um, you have the wonderful idea of the party outsourcing outrage, um, yeah, yeah. which is uh, a neat uh, alliterative uh, line. And the funny, Donald Trump represents many things, but in a way he represents re-insourcing the outrage. I think that there is this fascinating dialectic, if I could use that word, where the very forces the party unleashed on the outside are now on the inside of the party. Can you talk about Yeah. Because I think there is so much talk that Trump was imposed on the Republican Party. And I think the three of us agree very much that that is a mistaken way to look at the rise of Donald Trump. I'd love you to talk about yeah. that. I mean, I think Paul Paul's right that there is a lot of ways in which the Republican leadership is losing control of these groups to which it's outsourced outrage. Uh, the National Rifle Association, evangelical uh, Christian uh, and other conservative Christian organizations and right wing media, which becomes a sort of powerful group in its own, in its own right. Um, but but I think it's really important to understand that for all the party establishment, even the folks who are most uh, skeptical, if you will, of the kind of right wing populist side of the party, they all see a huge benefit from maintaining power. Right. So you've got Mitch McConnell, who's like the least populist. Uh, right-wing populist political figure in the party you can think of, right? And it's source of, and actually gets a lot of scorn from the Trumpistas. Um, that McConnell says that 2017 was the best year for conservatives on all fronts in 30 years. And organizations like the Koch network, you know, Charles Koch's um, massive rich donor network, they also they're skeptical of Trump. They don't want to support him as a candidate. But once he is the Republican nominee, and especially once he's in office, they recognize just how much they can actually achieve under him. Um, and Charles Koch later says, we have accomplished more in the last uh, five years than we have in the previous than in the previous 50 years. So that's, I think, a part of this outsourcing we should understand. There are really three big forces within the party. There is these uh, part party elites, uh, many in Congress. There is There are these um, surrogate groups that Paul mentioned, like the NRA. And then there is this kind of conservative plutocracy, which is becoming more and more powerful. And so I come back to your point, right? If there wasn't the kind of resources going to the top because of the Republican policies, there wouldn't be the kind of pressure on the party elite to keep providing these uh, really unpopular policies. I mean, just one last illustration. We uh, have a colleague who came up with a list of the of the, po the the least popular pieces of legislation in recent in the last 25 years. He basically looked at how popular major pieces of legislation, either passed or barely defeated, were in the last 25 years. And guess what? The two least popular pieces of legislation in the last 25 years are the Republicans' just barely defeated health care bill in 2017 and their tax bill in 2017. So that and you know, come 2018. All the sort of big money forces in the party are telling Republicans that these fiscal issues are a complete wasteland. You guys need to run on an immigrant invasion. So it's not it's it's these are not unrelated. That's the story we want to tell is that this is your right, a kind of loop. It's it. And there are exit ramps that become harder and harder to take. We should, by the way, may explain and we can get there why Donald Trump is running anywhere from eight to 15 points behind in the polls and why the Republicans lost the 2018 uh, yeah. elections. A couple of things uh, I want to encourage people to send in uh, questions. I believe you can do that through the YouTube channel you're watching, but there are ways of your getting questions to me. I have three here. Um, and I'm going to ask all three of them and you can do a division of labor uh, as to who uh, which you want to answer. Uh, one is what concerns you the most as we head into uh, the election? Um, a second question is, do either of you take Kanye West's run 
uh, for president seriously and how will it impact uh, Joe Biden's campaign? And thirdly, and you've touched on this and written about this a lot in your earlier books as well, um, please comment on uh, the impact of Citizens United on the overall environment. So your concerns about 2020, Kanye and Citizens United, um, whoever wants to begin with whichever. <laughs> well, I'll let Paul take all the hard questions and I'll take the easy question about Kanye West, which is uh, no, uh, <laughs> we don't take him very seriously. Uh, Paul, uh, it's your turn now. <laughs> uh, well, okay, so I'll, I'll I'll say something a little broader about that, and then maybe you can you can circle back to talking about Citizens United um, sure. and, and connecting that to to the to the book. Um, yeah. I mean, it's striking that two of these three questions were about were about the election, um, and um, and of course, this is a I think this is the most important election of my lifetime. Um, and because the difference in uh, likely trajectory of the country really is dramatically different uh, depending, depending on the outcome of the election. Um, I would say my biggest uh, concern about it is um, whether it will be free and fair, um, uh, particularly against the kind of backdrop um, that, um, that, we're, that we're facing with the combined economic and public health uh, crisis. Uh, and we spent some time talking in the book about um, an, another dynamic that's been underway on the right, we think, in the, in the last couple of decades, uh, which is also related to this basic conservative dilemma of, you know, how do you, if you're delivering most of the benefits that you're producing for a tiny select group of the population, how do you win elections? Well, so one way in which you win elections is by fashioning these other appeals uh, to voters who are not benefiting from your economic policies. But another thing you try to do is you try to shift the electoral playing field in such a way that you can win even if you're not winning over a lot of the voters. Um, and so uh, political scientists, you know, we're in conversation with lots of people now who are talking about the dangers of democratic backsliding, uh, the way in which elections can become less fair uh, and, um, and the, the playing field can be tilted in ways that allow a party that can't command a, a majority um, to nonetheless compete in elections uh, and, and win elections. Uh, and there are various dimensions of that that we could talk about it, but I, I, worry, I worry enormously about the prospect, for example, on election night when we know um, that millions and millions of, of votes will not yet have been counted of, um, of the president and his allies uh, screaming fraud uh, and trying to um, mobilize um, some kind of um, some kind of reaction against uh, against uh, the election results. Um, I'll just say more broadly. I mean, we you know one of the things that we really want to emphasize in the book is that we think that in general we've been saying this for a long time in our work is that we tend when we think about American politics to focus in very much on elections, and elections are really important. Um, but they're not the only thing that's important uh, and that the mobilization of powerful groups that doesn't stop on election day, uh, uh, but that shapes the, the agenda of government and who's running the government in extremely, uh, in extremely important ways, that is really central. So yes, yeah, so Trump runs as, as a different kind of Republican, uh, as a populist in some ways, but once he's elected, Republicans introduce these policies and, and uh, Trump supports them with enthusiasm uh, that cut $2 trillion in taxes and give 80% of the benefits of those tax cuts, of the permanent benefits of those tax cuts to the top 1% of the income distribution, right? And that's because these powerful groups didn't just stop when the election was over. They kept pushing. Yeah. And I think that is an answer, and, and you guys have been writing about this for some years, that is an answer to the question on Citizens United, which is it doesn't only affect the outcome of elections, but it has an even more powerful effect, money does, on what gets on and what doesn't get on um, the public agenda, which, uh, by the way, my, I, I'm just going to toss out something on the Kanye question. If this election is a referendum on Donald Trump, which I believe it is, then any third party candidate is probably more helpful to Trump than to Joe Biden, because at any third party candidate, even perhaps a rather conservative libertarian, may dilute 
uh, the anti-Trump vote. So I, I take all third party candidacies seriously, although with this kind of margin that might, if Biden were to maintain the margin he has now, they probably wouldn't matter. But this goes straight to what you both have just said. Um, the question on the board is, do you believe the Democrats can respond uh, to the real issues of inequality or will they have to answer to their money elites? And I yeah. guess I want to follow that. I, I want you to answer that alongside uh, another question. You mentioned Tom Frank um, and what's the matter with Kansas and whether one agrees entirely with Tom or not. I do think that a problem that progressives and Democrats have faced is very significant numbers of people in the country who are in the middle or closer to the bottom of the economy feel that government has not delivered for them uh, the tangible benefits that Democrats implicitly or sometimes explicitly promise uh, at election time. Um, how how does that play? How does that frank argument fit in? with your argument and how do you reply to this questioner about will Democrats deliver this time? Yeah, well, I mean, that question kind of ties back to the point you were making about Citizens United, right? Which is that money matters enormously and it it affects both parties. And Paul and I just uh, wrote a forward for a report that showed that one of the things that Citizens United has empowered is this kind of dark spending. And that when you look at it, Um, Even corporations that have very progressive stances on issues when they're public will contribute a lot of money uh, to Republicans and a lot of money uh, to conservative causes that uh, are anything but progressive. And uh, so I think that helps us understand that, you know, the role of money on the in the Democratic Party is profoundly cross pressuring. Um, It's cross pressuring in the sense that it can pull Democrats to emphasizing more uh, kind of uh, cultural and, and social issues like um, like um, uh, issues of, of choice, um, as opposed to focusing also on uh, fundamental economic issues like labor reform. Um, and it's cross pressuring uh, because, of course, it is once governance starts. Right. It's really hard to do things in the uh, in the American system because of the massive amounts of lobbying that will take place on any, you know, on any issue where you want to try to offer. Uh, really concrete benefits to ordinary Americans. Think of how hard it was uh, to get serious health care reform and how much that's still being contested. So uh, one self-reinforcing loop that we didn't talk about earlier, but I think is really fundamental, is that, yes, Republicans have played on all these racial and cultural issues, but they've also just uh, attacked government relentlessly, right, and made it hard to govern. There's a kind of weird, you know, and pain, painful self-reinforcing prophecy quality to it, right? Make government almost, you know, make it almost impossible to govern and then rail against government because it's not helping out uh, citizens. And so I do think that for Democrats, there is a kind of uh, more recognition than there has been in the past that they need to get, uh, do serious political reform. And, and to us, it's the reason that it's not just about this election and not just about Trump, notwithstanding what Paul said, right, that the vote rigging is a real threat. But the reason it's not just about that is because there are many ways in which our political system is basically allowed a minority and, and, is, and a super wealthy minority to kind of uh, pull government toward them and embed their preferences. I mean, look at the Supreme Court. McConnell said it was the best, you know, the best uh Congress in 30 years for conservatives be- in 2017, in large part because they were able to stack the court with highly conservative justices who will back rulings like Citizens United or prevent um, reform of the gerrymandering process or just side with corporations on almost every issue. Um, you know, So to me, that's really important to understand is that we not only face a threat from Donald Trump, a kind of authoritarian threat, but we also face what you might call a counter-majoritarian threat because our political system is really vulnerable to exploitation by powerful and resourceful minorities. So let me go to Paul. Are progressives and the center left up to this task? Uh, And let me sort of, um, which still goes to the questioner, but also to the electoral task. I mean, we are here on this screen as three white progressives. Um, The issue of race has presented itself so dramatically in our country and the question of racial uh, injustice. 
uh, in the past, going all the way back to Richard Nixon uh, and in some ways earlier, um, uh, the conservative politicians have been able to play on racial division in the country uh, to try to rally enough white voters to win elections in, a, uh, in courting white backlash. Um, and sometimes implicit racism, occasionally very explicit uh, kind of racism. That does not seem to be happening. It's, it's as if President Trump's pulling a lever and it's not attached to anything right now. Uh, something different is happening now. Um, and yet you can see tensions within the Democratic Party. Um, you saw them with the left of the party and Biden's, uh, Vice President Biden in the primaries. Uh, you're seeing some divisions uh, around where to go on policing, even though there is broad agreement on the need for police reform on the left. Talk about how you, are, lo you look at this complicated coalition that Democrats have, which I think precisely because of what you write about in the book is more complicated than ever because so many people have fled an increasingly radical Republican party and can only feel at home uh, with the Democrats. So all of that to you, Paul, you'll solve the problem in five right. minutes. And well, well, I, I, the first thing that I would say is that, that people should read Code Red because I think that you in, in oh. that book really, really wrestle with uh, the question about the, what the contem contemporary democratic coalition looks like and how, how it can function effectively. And I, I think I, I would underscore one point, I think, um, that, you, that you make in that book, right, which is um, that the different wings of the Democratic Party um, can play complementary roles in bringing about progressive change. Um, and that, that the left wing of the party pushes um, and helps shape that agenda in fundamental ways, and uh, maybe, maybe oversimplifying the way that the way that you put it in the book. But and then the the more moderate elements of the party are critical in creating a kind of majority coalition that can actually uh, translate some of this into a public policy that you can that you can get to move through uh, a political system that is frankly very biased against reform. Uh, and against the kinds of reforms that progressives favor, given the the acute rural bias that there is in the political system, for example, that we that we talk about in the book. Uh, and and to be honest, even though of course there are, in any broad winning coalition there are always going to be deep tensions. When I look at the Democratic Party right now, I see I see that process basically playing out. Um, and uh, because I see um, actually very high levels of support among us, there was polling published on just this just the last couple of days among Sanders and Warren voters, very, very high levels of support uh, for President Biden, um, you know, probably first and foremost. You jumped the gun. You said uh, President Biden. <laughs> well, they're they're supporting. They're, that's that's right, who they you want. Might be right. That's who they want to be president. Um, <laughs> And, um, you know, that's obviously partly because they don't they don't want the incumbent to stay in there. Um, but it's also it's also, I think, because they see that the, the Biden team has been working pretty hard uh, to actually build a coalition and bring uh, the Sanders and Warren forces into uh, shaping what the agenda is, is going to be. You know, the challenge is going to be actually if they win uh, legislating that in a system that is designed to produce gridlock. I'll just say one other thing. Um, which uh, to bring this back to some of the themes that we explore towards the end of the book, because we actually made a conscious choice not to talk that much about the Democrats. Um, so the country is undergoing this profound demographic transition, right? Uh, and um, in, in, in racial terms. Um, and um, uh, the Republican Party has been fighting, has been waging a race against time. Um, because in a system in which people actually do have uh, free and fair elections, reasonably free and fair elections, uh, a party that relies overwhelmingly on white support and increasingly now on the support of whites who do not have a college education. Um, it's not a coalition that is going to be able to win elections, right? So that's very dangerous in the short run. Um, but in the long run, if we can keep the, the car from running off the road, if we can keep democracy going in the U.S., um, the Republican Party is going to be forced to adapt, um, or they'll be permanently marginalized the way that the Republican Party in California has been marginalized. 
Um, we actually think that that's a healthy thing, that it'll produce a more a healthier politics and a politics that's more responsive uh, to the demands of ordinary citizens, including ordinary citizens who face enormous challenges and did so even before uh, the current, you know, combo public health economic crisis hit. Um, so we think that's going to be an important part of a healthier politics going forward is a, the potential for a healthier kind of two-party co uh, competition, uh, but one in which there will need to be, a successful party will need to be more responsive to the demands of ordinary citizens. You know, it's funny you say that, by the way, thank you for your kind words earlier. I, I send you a big hug across the air, if I may. Um, the, uh, uh, the, yeah, right, a, a socially distanced hug. Um, the on this question of the Republican Party, I have two books sitting on this desk I'm working at, both um, sort of looking to a different and better kind of conservatism and republicanism. The only problem is most of those books are written by liberals. And, uh, you know, you look at um, maybe the people running the Lincoln Project, uh, running these ads against uh, uh, Trump uh, from the Republican side, maybe some of the people at the Bulwark and a few other Conservative writers are ready to do something, but it's really striking that most of the desire for a better form of conservatism comes from progressives uh, or from at least non-conservatives. Uh, do you want to take that up? And then I want to go uh, to Jacob on something in the book. And there are a couple of other, there are some more good questions here. Go ahead. Well, this, I mean, a lot of people who think of themselves as conservatives have been driven out or, or, or on the center right, they've been driven out of the Republican Party. Right. They don't they don't see themselves in the current Republican Party. Um, so I, I'm not saying that this transformation would be easy. And um, and I have to say, we're I, I wouldn't say that we're optimistic. I would say that we're hopeful. Um, but we recognize that there are a lot of other possibilities, some of which are um, quite frightening to think about, to be to be honest. Um, so I don't, I don't think that this would be easy or automatic. Um, but there is a, we do believe um, that political parties and democracies, mostly they do want to win elections um, and um, that parties um, who cannot effectively uh, develop a winning appeal to voters are, are likely to change that appeal over time. Um, so, uh, so for a Republican party that can engage in racial outrage, which is going to be increasingly true as the United States becomes more thoroughly multiracial in its makeup. Um, for a party like that, they're going to have to change the way that they talk to American citizens. And part of that is going to be actually being a little bit more responsive or maybe a lot more responsive uh, to the economic and social needs of ordinary citizens. You can see that on issues like healthcare where you know, the Republicans simply cannot be honest about their proposals um, not remotely honest about their proposals and have any hope of selling um, uh, what, what they're trying to sell. Jacob, all your books that you to get, have done together have excellent chapter titles, among other things. And I'd like you to talk about a very civil war, <laughs> um, which is not, it's a war that's not very civil, in fact, but it is a very civil war. Could you talk about that chapter? I hope my memory is, is serves me right. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Um, so that takes off from the endless number of articles that were written about the civil war within the Republican Party between the Trump allied right wing populist and the um, you know Ryan allied um, establishment uh, politicians, and and what you know I think. What's really striking to us is the extent to which the establishment and the kind of plutocratic uh, supporters of it um, got so much of what they wanted in the early days of the Trump administration. Um, and, and, and I think we tend to focus on legislation, and that's been a big part of it. But there's just also the degree to which this administration stacked uh, all of the regulatory agencies yes. with people who were essentially... Um, uh, you know, in the industry or lobbyists for the industry, the degree to which um, it has, through executive actions, tried to undo e almost every sort of positive uh, regulatory step that's been taken over the last 15 or 20 years to make people healthier, safer, um, and, to, and to rescue our environment from the existential threat of climate change. And the degree to which, and I think this is also just really transparent now, it's just torn down the capacity of government to do anything positive 
uh, a capacity that was already weakened um, by these attacks on government for, for, for decades. That, that's, I think, really striking. I, I want to say one, you know, one thing about this, which I think gets to the earlier point you uh, were drawing out, which is that it is true that there are forces within the Republican or allied with the Republican Party that are trying to map out a kind of different conservatism. I think the most uh, positive example of this are, are Republican governors in uh, so-called blue states, right? Um, like your own Larry Hogan, who have, because they're not so tightly tied to the, the national Republican Party, they've been able to be successful. But I do think we really should understand that um, the, the establishment of the party, which is really basically uh, all of those in office and a lot of the organizations from the Chamber of Commerce to the Koch brothers, uh, huge uh, organization, or the, the now Charles Koch's huge organization, that they all um, were basically willing to support the kind of extremism, uh, uh, re rhetorical and policy extremism of Trump uh, on ethno-nationalist uh, policies um, because they were able to get so much of what they wanted uh, in, with regard to the kind of plutocratic policies that we that we talk about. And so that's why I think it's not just a demographic story, right? As important as, as that is, it's also a story about, well, how do we wean <laughs> both the Republican and the Democratic parties, but especially the Republican Party, off of plutocracy, right? This is a party that can't quit the plutocrats. How can we get them uh, to move toward a more moderate stance on economics as well as to abandon the kind of racial division that is tearing apart our country. We can view your book as a compassionate intervention uh, toward yeah. the Republican Party. I want to. I have some great questions here. You can come back on that. Um, um, and I'm going to add one to this first one. What do you think Donald Trump will do post presidency? What about Mike Pence? Um, I want to just, we, he's not post-president yet. I'm very curious, uh, I know he wouldn't or you wouldn't answer the question if Donald Trump said, what the heck do I do now, you guys? I know you hate me, but you know a lot. What's your fear about what he might do? But then what would he do after all this? And what about Pence? Uh, the other question, which is right up your alley, is what happens politically if the estate tax is made up to date? I assume that means higher. Uh, and the top brackets go up 10 percent. Um, so why don't you guys uh, in your you, you, you naturally divide labor. So uh, you can I'll leave it to you to divide those questions. Well, let me start. Um, I, I'm not I don't think I want to speculate about um, about the individual uh, people, Pence, Pence and Trump. But I'll just talk a little bit about the dynamics um, at the at at the end of the book. You know, we, we may not make any friends with uh, the arguments that we make because we make we make two arguments about the future. One is that we think in order for the United States to get back on the right path, um, that um, that the Republicans have to lose bigly <laughs> in, the, in the election this year, that that this um, that this path that they've been on, this plutocratic populist path, which is really dragging down the country, we believe, um, uh, it, it has to be fundamentally repudiated, but in order to open up space for um, the kinds of reforms that would that would restore uh, a healthier society and a healthier democracy. All right, so that'll make some people happy that we say that. But then we turn around and say, over the medium run, over the long run, critical to restore, restoring a healthy democracy is restoring a healthy conservative party. Um, because the American political system is designed to have two major parties. Uh, that essentially has been true almost always. Um, and over any, any significant period of time, it's true just because of the way the rules are written. Uh, and uh, one of those parties is, is going to be more conservative. Uh, and you want that to be a party uh, that feels like it can compete um, and will believe in democracy and believe that it has something to offer to American citizens. We think that that's a good thing and it's something to be encouraged. I can't imagine that either Mike Pence or Donald Trump would be a part of such a party, right? based, yeah. on, based on the role that they have already played in American politics. So uh, the future I imagine, uh, and I'm not saying that I think this is something that would happen easily or that would happen automatically, 
um, over um, uh, immediately after an election. But if there is a big electoral repudiation, which I think looks more and more uh, possible, if not likely, um, then the hope is that that will force a really fundamental rethinking within the conservative party uh, about how it wants to engage with an increasingly uh, multiracial polity and one that is marked by stark inequalities. Uh, and that is, um, uh, you know, that that is a conversation that is that is going to take some time, but that could change. Uh, that could change a lot of things. And I do think the Republican Party is is ripe for a true autopsy report, right? That would acknowledge that not just the Trump presidency seems to be um, moving from disaster to disaster, but that this was also true of the last Republican president. You know, George W. Bush, by this point in his second term, was actually way less popular than Donald Trump is today. His approval rating was in the 20s um, because he seemed to just be careening from disaster to disaster. Uh, so it is definitely time for a wake up call. Yeah. And, and Jacob, I just want to throw another question in. I just sure. want to make sure that you can add that to the earlier questions, including the one on the estate tax and the top bracket. Um, uh, someone wants to know, do you believe there is a shift of voters who supported President Trump in 2016, but are not planning to support him in 2020? So I can answer. Yes, yeah, yeah. I can answer that question pretty quickly that there are certainly that's what the polling is suggesting. Um, and um, and importantly, I think it's not just about w whether the same voters are supporting Trump or not, but also about the differential enthusiasm between the two parties and the extent to which, you know, Trump really did win with very narrow margins in key states. He didn't get uh, a majority of the popular vote, as everyone knows. And his reelection strategy rests completely on his capacity to win those states, you know, narrowly again. Um, therefore, you know, uh, just squeaking through in the Electoral College, which is an anachronistic institution <laughs> that uh, that fits closely with some of the other institutions we have that really prioritize rural um, rural voters. But let me let me get to your your other question about the wealth tax and the state tax idea and, and top tax bracket. And, there's a quote we have in the book. It's very familiar, but I have to quote it. It's uh, from Justice Brandeis, who says, you can have a society in which wealth is concentrated in the hands of a few, or you can have a democracy, but you can't have both. And his point was that when inequality is this extreme, wealth inequality and income inequality are this extreme, it's really hard to have a political system that upholds this idea that all people have the equal potential to influence what government does. And um, and I do think that we're at a very um, important moment uh, where uh, actually tackling this inequality, particularly with taxes on the very, very rich, is actually a winning political strategy. It's highly popular, right? So it, I think in a way that may not have been true uh, a decade and a half ago, but is, you know, but is really, really true today, uh, it's, it's possible to begin this process right, of pushing back against a level of inequality that's higher than any other rich democracy. There was a study just out that, that, um, that says that of the global top 1%, that's the richest 1% in the world, uh, fully half of them <laughs> are in the United States, right? We, we're number one in pandemics and plutocrats right now. Um, and we really need to, and we can't tackle the plutoc the pandemic in part because of the plutocracy. So I think that this is just a small step in the right direction, but it could start a positive loop where these resources, which right now are getting often getting poured into politics, um, get poured instead into um, popular programs for ordinary Americans. And we start to see government regaining some of the trust and, and support that it's lost over this difficult generation. I hope somebody watching just tweeted out Jacob's quotes. We're number one in plutocrats and pandemics. Uh, that's a remarkable uh, statement and true. Um, the I want to um, I want to ask a question of my own. It's a kind of personal question, and I want to ask another here, which I think is uh, just by the way to the the questioner on uh, vote switching from. Trump. Uh, one of my favorite facts is that 
in 2018 in Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, 10 to 15 percent of Trump voters shifted to the Democrats, to Democratic candidates for governor and Senate. And you're seeing those kind of shifts going on in the polling toward Biden. So I think there is uh, the Trump vote is not monolithic one time. You know, one vote is forever. I, I think he's going to be losing. He's right now he's losing support. Um, so two questions. The, uh, I'll ask the one on the board here from a uh, watcher. Thank you for this. Uh, why do you think the Republican leadership has not stood against President Trump's behavior? A widely asked question. Um, I wanted to ask you a, a question, Jacob, uh, that really goes back to your work all the way at the beginning. Um, uh, people out there should know you are the inventor, essentially, of the public option, uh, that your undergraduate thesis became a book, a well-respected book on the failure of the Clinton health care plan all the way back then. Um, the climate, we already had the victory of Obamacare, but the climate on health care seemed very different even before the pandemic and seems different now. So um, I want somebody to answer why Republicans don't stand up to Trump. And maybe maybe Paul could take that briefly. Uh, we're going to run out of time fairly shortly. And Jacob, I'd just like you to do the healthcare landscape for us, because you know, we clearly have made progress from when you wrote that first book of yours all those years ago. Paul. So it's a great question um, and uh, one that we ask each other uh, quite a bit as we watch astonishing behavior and see, you know, just just an amazingly low level of dissent among important figures in the Republican Party, at least as long as they are important figures in the Republican Party. The very quick answer that I would give is um, that there's a machine um, and that machine includes both the outrage groups that we've been talking about, which are very powerful with any Republican who wants, who has to face a primary or wants a lucrative career after they, after they finish in politics. Uh, and the other part of the machine, which is also very powerful, is the, the plutocratic McConnell uh, wing of it. Um, and both sides, both parts of that machinery have been very happy with Donald Trump. Uh, and they very much um, like being the governing party. Um, and so as long as they think that their best bet is to have, um, uh, is to not have a split within the party. And I think it re that remains true, even with Trump being as unpopular and as erratic as he is, they're not going to break with him. Um, because to do that would mean breaking with the entire powerful machinery of the Republican party, uh, which is a career ender. Yeah. And let me circle in answering your great question about health care, EJ, let me circle back to something you said earlier, which is that Trump seems to be pulling the lever, the racist lever, but nothing's happening. And I think it's worth remembering that he not only had that in 2016, but he also looked like a different kind of Republican on these issues like health care. Um, and of course, he abandoned those stances almost immediately after he came into office. But, you know, he definitively said, I will not cut Medicaid. Um, he said, uh, and yet that was a centerpiece of the health care bill that uh, almost passed the next year. And, and I mentioned that because I think, you know, what we've seen is that Americans uh, really believe that uh, the expansion of coverage under Medicaid and the, the great role that Medicare plays for the elderly and disabled, that these are really vital. And so if there's been a shift, and I, I think it does kind of come back to this idea of the public option that people really think, if we're going to expand coverage, let's expand Medicare and Medicaid. Let's make sure that more Americans can get into the programs that we think are working well. And this is a, a general point about the, the Biden campaign, which is, as many have pointed out, it's actually you know taken very progressive stances on a lot of issues. It's been pushed to do so by the primary campaigns, and it's pushed to do so by the COVID crisis. But on health care, I think it could still go toward, uh, you know, I, I, I think it could actually have a more robust idea for a public option. I think it could do more to make sure that everyone will have health insurance and more to contain costs. And it reminds me of a quote that you know well, right, where um, Franklin Roosevelt meets with some organizers, right? And he says at the end, when they tell them about all these great things they want him to do, they say at the end, he says, well, you've convinced me. Now make me do it. Um, and so I just say to all those who are listening, in addition to reading the book, uh, and we really hope you do, you know, where you care about and these buy things. buy the book, by the way. Yeah, 
Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, no. I, I, and and then make you know, and then get involved and and make politicians do it um, in the in, in, on all the issues you care about. Because I, I do think ultimately what we're saying in this book is that we've had a politics that substituted outrage and division for responding to the felt needs of ordinary Americans. Now we need people who are engaged on so many fronts now to really demand the kinds of policies that we as a society need to move forward into the 20, the, you know, into the future with, uh, with confidence rather than fear. That is beautiful. And we, that, that is exactly a right way to end, but we have a couple of minutes left. So, I want to ask what to me is a what might be a classic hacker, Pearson, Pearson hacker uh, question. I, I take the ticket either way myself. Um, the um, you have shown in this book and in all your other work how very substantial majorities of um, Americans actually take broadly progressive positions on policy uh, issues. Um, what is wrong with progressives that they haven't been able to activate that? Is it that cultural issues end up trumping these questions for other voters? Because in a sense, this book and all the other books you've written together have been an effort to activate an existing majority, not invent a majority that wasn't there. Um, so I'd just like you to talk about how, um, you know, looking forward and Looking at the polls now, which do show a big problem for Trump and the Republican Party, just take us there. Take us how this, these majorities you have described very steadily uh, can, act, can actuate themselves. So I'll, I'll, I'll start and um, say one um, worrisome thing, and then I'll let, I'll let Jacob um, offer some, some optimism. Um, I think a huge obstacle, we've emphasized this in our work, um, is the structure of American political institutions. And um, so we're political scientists, bear, so bear with us. Um, and, but I think there is um, a, a concern and frustration that flows out of the fact that people feel like they vote, you vote for President Obama, uh, and so then all these things should happen that he said that he wanted to do. Um, and of course, there are a lot of reasons why, I mean, some of them did happen, you know, he, I think, you know, particularly when they had a majority in Congress, they, uh, they were able to do a fair amount, some really important things. Um, and um, he tried to do a bunch through, um, through executive uh, action as well. Um, but the political system is designed for gridlock, and it's um, highly biased against, in electoral terms, highly biased, the Senate in particular, um, but also the House now and the Electoral College against the more kind of urban suburban coalition that the Democratic Party has formed, you know, which often means that you're in this situation where you're either facing a filibuster uh, or you're forced to rely on Democrats who were elected in states that are way more conservative um, than the average voter in the country as a whole. Um, so that's a big challenge uh, for a Democratic Party that's trying to be more progressive. I do think um, there is clearly, we, we are likely to see a wave of reform uh, because um, the political moment just calls for it. And if Democrats win a big victory, they'll be able to do a fair amount. Uh, but we should not be naive about the ease with which a president uh, backed only by, say, political will, to use a, a term uh, that I think casual observers of American politics like to use, uh, can simply rewrite uh, what government does. It's, it's a long slow, difficult challenge. Well, I don't want to end on that on that negative note. And anyway, this is kind of a argument that Paul and I have all the time. Um, he and I are, we're probably both glass half empty guys, but I, I'm more likely to, to see it a little more full, if you will. Um, and so let me offer a few positive things. I mean, I do think as Paul said, that our politics has been dominated, as you've written about too, EJ, by this kind of backlash politics where you get, you know, people press the mad as hell button uh, in, in an election and then uh, they hope for the best. And so that's and, and it hasn't always happened. And that's that's what's running against Trump right now, I think, very much is that people are very dissatisfied with the direction of the country. The challenge will be to figure, as Paul said, will be to figure out how to govern in a way that will take the 
the the anger uh, and and channel it into something productive uh, going forward. And and I think there are I think the one good thing to say is I think actually you're right that on a lot of these issues there are progressive majorities and the three things that have stand stood in the way besides our political institutions making this difficult are the ability to use this kind of racial um, and cultural resentment uh, to to um, to get voters. Um, on without responding to their economic needs. Um, and that seems to be uh, a lot harder. Uh, it's really proved much more difficult for Trump as, uh, as, you, as we've seen. The other is um, this distrust of government. And I do think, you know, just as there's no uh, atheists in foxholes, there's no libertarians in a pandemic. People think government really needs to act here. So hopefully, you know, they don't think government's doing a good job, but hopefully that this uh, this support for government acting will be translated into into positive uh, steps that people recognize in their lives. Uh, and the last thing I think is money. You know, the money has pulled the, both parties um, to the right. And um, and I think that's an, that's a problem that can be addressed. It can be addressed just by reducing the concentration of wealth and income at the very top. But it can also be addressed through political reforms. We don't have any illusions about it being easy. But um, but as Paul said before, there are these powerful forces, um, demographic and um, and political, as people react to rising inequality and, and, and awake to the realities of racial uh, inequality. And so that those powerful forces, if uh, channeled into constructive action and political reform over time, might result in a virtuous cycle that could replace the vicious cycle our politics has been trapped in. Thank you. Um, I think that the joy of this book uh, is that it makes you laugh at times. It makes you cry at times. It makes you understand better, but it also makes you hope. And I think you, we've heard some of that hope. I love hearing not only Jacob and Paul talk. I really enjoy hearing them talk to each other. And I'm glad you all had the opportunity uh, to see that. I'd love to watch someday a real drag out argument between uh, you guys. Thank Never you happened. to you. Never have. I, yes. Uh, I, I want to thank Jacob uh, Hacker and Paul Pearson. Their book is Let Them Eat Tweets, How the Right Rules in an Age of Extreme Inequality. I wish we were there so you could buy it there and they would sign it for you. But we do encourage you uh, to pick up uh, their new book at your favorite uh, uh, independent bookstore. Um, we also want to thank all of the viewers who joined us. Uh, and the Commonwealth Club has a wide range of programs coming up, so you should uh, uh, check them out on the website. Um, and I've always wanted to say this. I'm E.J. Dion, and this virtual Commonwealth Club program is adjourned.